Hello, I'm Professor Greg Pasternak, and this is a presentation about geomorphic covariant structures. So I'm going to explain to you why we came up with the idea of geomorphic covariant structures in my lab group and how you can use it for both analysis of rivers and design of rivers. And I also want to give special recognition and credit to my PhD student, Rocco Brown, who really initiated this work and really, really played an important role in getting all this going. Okay, so let's go through an outline of today's presentation. First, I'm going to talk about what I call reach scale vanilla rivers. Then I'm going to talk about the modern developments in the 21st century, about our emerging understanding of organized complexity in fluvial form and processes. And it's really important to appreciate that this very idea of complexity just means that which we yet to understand. Like, what makes something complex versus something simple. It's basically if it makes us un uncomfortable, then we, we think of it as complex or too complex. So anyway, but let's see what we can understand from modern methods. Then I'm going to use those modern methods to introduce and explain the theory of geomorphic covariance structures. And finally, I'm going to show you some example results from, an from a pair of articles we published in 2018. And I think I have some more updated results since then. Well, let's begin with recognizing that what made science very powerful in the latter half of the 20th century was the paradigm of statistical sampling. Statistical sampling allows you to take a very large population and figure out some things about it by only characterizing a very small amount of it, what we would call a sample. But it's important to understand that the main thing that statistical sampling does is get at the central tendency of the thing you're looking at. It can characterize the variance of it and other basic statistical metrics, of course, probability distributions, for example. But it's not really good at getting at the deterministic processes of what is underlying the natural phenomenon. And while randomness certainly plays a role in natural phenomenon, there also is a lot of um, you know, physics and uh, chemical, biological driven mechanisms that are at work in the environment too. So for example, if you have a whole watershed and you want to know what the central tendency of some attribute is, like let's say what is the overall width of rivers, you can get that central tendency by doing cross sections such as illustrated by these red lines and characterizing that. And so we saw in the late 20th century a lot of this kind of work. Uh, one of my, you know, PhD, uh, and Ma well, PhD advisors, uh, Lucian Brush, was the, the husband of, of my PhD professor, Grace Brush, and he wrote this paper in 1961 characterizing the central tendency of central Pennsylvania streams. So on the x-axis is the bankful discharge in cubic feet per second. Sorry for international audience, these are the American units. And we see we have a logarithmic scale there. And then on the y-axis, we have the bankful geometry dimension. So the bankful is, remember, it's this, the size of the channel that uh, in an alluvial river has been carved by the flow over a long period of time that seems to be about in balance with the flow and sediment supply. So this geometry, you could see there are clear central tendencies that width in black, uh, depth in blue, and velocity in red all generally increase as, you know, uh, the amount of flow they need to pass increases. So the, basically more water is shoving this thing open. And these tend to be provided as regional relationships for a given climate and physiographic, you know, geological attributes and so forth, uh, tectonic uplift rate. But you, you know, from a scientific perspective, the main goal was to simply get this central tendency and, and show that there is a power function relationship here. From a statistical point of view, the points that are varying about these lines doesn't really matter. It's just noise. However, it's not an inconsequential amount of noise. The variability uh, for width tends to be around 30 to 50 percent for these kinds of data sets, and uh, less for depth, like you know maybe only 15 to 30 percent. But these are still significant. So where this comes into play is that a lot of times in river design. Geomorphologists are brought in to tell the engineers what are the general attributes, size and shape that a river should have. And for that purpose, the value that's provided here is the value along the line. 
So based on the characterization of you know whatever the approach to get bankful geometry, uh, bankful discharge, then you would you would come up from that value, hit the line, and then go across, and that would give you a good sense of that value. And there's a, there's more to it, of course, than that. I'm just trying to to summarize it, so we don't need to get pedantic right now. But the real underlying assumption of this methodology is that even though there's noise here, that if you're in this ballpark, rivers would naturally be self-tending towards correction. So let's say you know a particular river ought to be a little bit off this line. If you build to the line, then it should self-correct if you're within the, the range of that self-adjustment. However, there's been a lot of research done about rivers that has shown it's just not working out this way. In other words, the approach of mimicking these landforms to, to match regional um, tendencies is not yielding you know, rivers that are at all um, self-regulating. So let's try to understand that a little bit more. But ultimately, where we're going here is the recognition for the 21st century that what our science is all about now is understanding that the variability about this line is the story of fluvial geomorphology. It's what we're all about because the variability here expresses how local phenomenon are controlling things. And the local phenomenon could be local topographic structure, it could be wood supply, it could be beavers, it could be all kinds of things that are playing a role. And these are all very important, more than just what is, what is um, represented in this function. So ultimately, geomorphic covariance structure theory is all about variance. Here's just another example extrapolating, instead of just bankful uh, discharge related to width and depth, we could then relate width to meander length and meander length to radius of curvature and, and, and so forth. And you know, I, I give a variety of lectures on these things. I don't feel like going into those details now. But the point is that all of this has led to a design approach of mimicking landforms, where you try to go out and get some reference reach that you think is working naturally, and that if you mimic the boundary condition, that is the topography of that system, and scale it a little bit to the size of the system that you're interested in, then you can, um, you know, you, you can basically um, replicate that wherever you want to have it. Now, if we think about it, those approaches give you reach average values, right? That's what those are. It's like you go out and you take a number of cross sections from a river and by various methods you compute the reach average value. Well, if you were to actually design a river to the reach average value, you'd end up with something like what I'm showing here on the right, which is an oblique view of a vanilla river, as I like to call it. It's a river designed to the reach average attribute. So the cross section has the exact you know, width, depth, and um, you know, flood prone area as is specified in this case for an F4 channel using the Roskin classification. F4s do have sinuosity, but just to simplify this to fit on a slide, I included it without sinuosity. But with or without sinuosity, the point here is that it really isn't adequate for characterizing a river or um, thinking about what processes are a player in a river if all you know about it are its reach average attributes. In other words, the underlying theory from the 20th century that bankful discharge controlled in a significant way the dynamism of rivers, in my opinion, is fundamentally wrong. It may play a role in setting the regional tendency of size and shape, but it plays very little role in the, in the set, the palette of processes that are at play in a river. And just as an example, here's a, a, a real river that this archetype would be representing. And there's a lot more things that are going on here than can be represented with this simple vanilla attribute. So again, a vanilla river in my terminology is a river whose design is based solely on reach average metrics. And that just isn't adequate to characterize the rivers. Why is that? Well, I like to think of a vanilla river as kind of like a wind instrument, like a flute or a saxophone. Imagine that you know these, these instruments all have little holes all along them. But imagine you didn't do that. You just held this thing and you blew softly in, into it and made a tone with your flute. 
or well, a flute would be this way, sorry, but you know, your saxophone, whatever. Um, you blow into it, your trumpet. Well, now imagine that you blow harder and harder and harder. What happens to the sound of a wind instrument as you blow harder? It gets louder, but it mostly just gets worse and worse sounding. But the key thing is it does not change the tone. So you're essentially adjusting the amplitude of the signal, but you're not changing the frequency and the phase of that signal to put it in more mathematical or signal processing terms. So now let's think about what happens by analogy when water is blowing through a straight channel, a vanilla channel at reach average metrics. It's no different than that. You're just putting water down a pipe. And what can happen to it? Well, really there's two processes that can happen. One is that that water can scour the bed and two, it can scour the banks. Now, is it enough just with that that you could then institute meandering and braiding and other things? It is plausible that those things can happen and there are plenty of flume experiments that explore some of those dynamics. However, most of the dynamism that you see in rivers is not simply because you have more or less water. It's because of the boundary conditions that are at play as well as the variability in flow conditions. So if we remember that river processes are represented by a partial differential equation, set of equations for, you know, we have mass conservation, momentum conservation, and then both of those for water and sediment in three dimensions, then what you can note is that if you've studied any of that math, even in the most basic way, that, that these sorts of differential equations what, how they play out depends on both the initial conditions um, of inputs and the boundary conditions. So the inputs would be the flow regime and the sediment supply regime, and then the boundary conditions would be like the topography, the presence of wood, boulders, uh, impacts of beavers, and vegetation. So, you know, the idea that just by changing the flow alone that you get dynamism in rivers is flawed because it requires the equal contribution of the boundary regime. And so that's the key here is that most geomorphic processes require topographic variability. Now, to the extent that you know, a flood might start to break apart topography and institute variability that can then assert itself, maybe there is some amount of self-driving mechanisms that can take place. Um, but in most cases, natural rivers already have that in place. It's, it's developed hand in hand with uplift and uh, in channel erosion. And so it's, it's always been there. It's only now that we can think about like having straightened rivers and then what to do about them that we have to worry about somehow starting from a stage zero with a straight river and, and somehow instituting this variability again. When we look at rivers that have been built by landform mimicry, we fall into what's called the uncanny valley problem. It's a problem that's re been recognized in computer science, video games, and art for a long time. The idea here is that the closer you get to making something the way it's naturally supposed to be, and traditionally that is like a person. So here is like a, you know, a robot that's made to look a lot like a human. Well, there's a point where if you make something, it looks nothing like that thing in reality, it doesn't bother you. But the closer and closer you get to a human likeness, and this is this axis, then the y-axis here is human familiarity. You plunge into this hole of horror, like where you, you look at something and you're like, there's something seriously wrong here. This is like far away from being human. And it's like that with rivers. You know, the average person, you know, I go out to a river with my dad and, and, and he just looks at it, you know, oh, what a nice place. And I'm like, oh my God, you can't, dad, like what's here? You know, it's, uh, it's not like that at all. And you know, you look at this photo, it's, uh, it's from, from um, you know, White Marsh Run in Maryland, one of my, my home rivers, I grew up in Maryland. And, and you know, we know this is just total Frankenstein River, right? I mean, as it was uh, in 1996. You know, you, you look at the riprap along the bank, we have a purportedly, you know, ostensibly meandering river, but there's absolutely nothing natural here. This is totally in the uncanny valley. So, you know, of course, the fundamental idea of like making stable rivers that can't vary is, uh, goes against the very idea of natural because natural rivers are dynamic. They don't have to be stable. They don't have to be uh, unchanging in, in some trending direction. They, they, can, they can change. So how do we get to a point where we can 
design rivers that don't fall in the uncanny valley but get past it. And for sure, we know that in the video industry, they are getting past it. I mean, we, today we have deep fakes that I can't tell the difference between a person and, 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 a, and a, uh, a fake anymore. So they're they've beyond the uncanny valley. And there's no reason why we can't mindfully actively restore rivers back beyond the uncanny valley there as well. We just, you know, we, don't, we can't be, we have to be humble about it. Um, we're not saying that, you know, we are nature, but we, we, you know, humanity has done a lot of things beyond what anyone dreamed could be possible. And I th don't think we should start from a place from assuming we can never get it right. Okay, well, a lot of moralism here, I guess. But anyway, so what are some of the problems? I mean, I'm telling you that, that you know, mimicry fails. Some of you may already know that if you're already quite experienced, but let me just show you some examples. Here's a mountain meadow where a channel was carved into it to match bankful dimensions. Uh, and what you can see here is that it's, it's composed of cohesive mud anyway. So of course, when you carve a channel out of essentially you know, non-erodible material, that's not going to change. However, what you can see that has changed is that when they made this, they brought in a whole lot of spawning gravel for fish to use. And so that then created the experiment for us where that material, um, it either would be self-sustainable that you know what they put in would stay where it's supposed to stay and be refreshed by new material to refresh pool riffle relief or not. And in this case, you can see that all of the material on what was originally a riffle has completely washed away. Here's the opposite part of that case. This is now moving down to the Central Valley of California on the Merced River, where there too, they made a pool riffle relief. They have a lot of gravel. But in this case, the, by design, the engineers made the riffles narrow and the pools wide, which is, of course, the exact opposite of what is self-sustainable, as I'll prove to you later. And what happened in that case, now I'm showing you the pool, is that all of the sediment just eroded off the riffles and deposited in the pools. You, know, you see this island that's forming with vegetation on it. You also see the big pool that's forming here, which is telling you that the effective width that the river really wants to be is just this narrow amount. In other words, probably about one fifth to one tenth. If it had the sediment supply at hand, it would just grow a giant bar here and it would wipe out the outer bank and it would make entirely different morphology. So in both of these cases, what you see is the system has been designed wrong because it's not aware of the geomorphic covariance structures that are necessary to create a natural topographic regime. However, in both cases, the response of the system to fix itself is limited because there is still other controls on the system, either you know, regulated flows or lack of sediment supply or you know, cohesive, essentially bedrock here that basically just can't fix itself. And in some cases, things might be able to fix themselves to self-sustainability. In other cases, it might have to just erase itself off the landscape back to like a stage zero setting and then start from there and grow the proper morphology um, from scratch. And here we are back again with um, White Marsh Run in, in, in Maryland, where originally there were no riprap here along the bank, but you know, you've got Ikea and a lot of commercial development, and this is already an incised river. And so of course, once you're incised, we have to protect the bank for suburban development, and it just, you know, it just isn't viable. It's not viable to create a meandering river that's not allowed to meander. But even within that scenario, it was even worse because the natural meandering was perfectly, like almost perfectly sinusoidal, and rivers, while they are sinuous, are not perfect sinusoids. And in this case, the river just chose to cut itself off. So then they came in and they rip wrapped the heck of the point bar because they didn't want that to happen. So there is a broad consensus among academic geomorphologists that landform mimicry based on building vanilla channels with reach average metrics just doesn't work. Now, this could be updated quite a bit. Like just because this type of landform mimicry failed doesn't mean that building landforms of itself is a failure and we shouldn't do it at all. What it means is that you can't just blindly and prayerfully build something and assume it's going to work. That's not how this thing goes. You have to actually understand the underlying mechanisms of why those landforms are there and how a particular landform regime can produce self-sustainable topography. 
And self-sustainable, by the way, it's, it's a term that um, at least goes back to Luna Leopold. He wrote a paper, I believe it was called, I want to say it's called Rivers, but it was in American Scientist. It's worth looking up. It's an overview about rivers, but it talks about self-sustainability without formally defining it. But we use it to just mean the idea that rivers can use their water and sediment supply to maintain a diverse assemblage of landforms like riffle run, pool glide, that they don't just all fall apart back to um, a flat, straight river. So there's a variety of other processes that we need to be mindful of. Um, rivers do tend to have variable width, so we want local scour at constrictions and deposition at expansions. Rivers are often meandering, which means they have lateral migration processes with cut bank undermining on the outer bank and point bar deposition on the inner bank. There is avulsion where a channel can, can blast out, um, the water can blast out of a channel and cut a new path across um, the overbank area. We can have nick point migration, <clears throat> like if the base level drops, um, then, then that can change, or if you have a change in sediment supply. And we can have a lot of processes being induced by vegetation. Okay, so let's return to the outline of today's presentation and we're gonna move on. I've explained to you what I mean by reach scale vanilla rivers and the problems of landform, or you know, when you try to mimic landforms and, and how that doesn't lead to the processes that we need. A lot of our understanding now about the importance of variability of rivers, not, not only topographic variability, but flow variability too, and sediment supply variability, is emerging from the phenomenal uh, growth of remote sensing, both active and passive remote sensing of rivers. So we're gonna talk about that next. What's really important is that we have to adhere to the scientific method. The scientific method, everybody thinks they know it, they think they're using it, but most times, rather than not, when I read journal articles, they're not actually employing the whole scientific method as much as they could be. So we have to begin, if we're gonna work on a design, or if we're trying to understand a river, whichever it is, you have to start by having the courage to try to conceptualize the processes that you think are there. Once you've conceptualized it, you need to make specific tractable hypotheses about what are the key processes that are sustaining the system in a natural state. And then conversely, if a system's in a degraded state, what are the key processes that are missing that explain that? We can't just assume that like humans are all the problem and we just take humans away and everything will go back to perfection. Um, I mean, first of all, it just isn't realistic, but you know, it's more than that. So once you have those hypotheses, normally in the scientific method, we would then collect data and we would be using this data within an experimental design framework in which we have specific variables whose values either go one way or another way to either say, yes, this hypothesis seems to be right or no, this hypothesis is wrong. So once you have that framework, you can then analyze data to extract the values for the test variables and use the performance indicators for those variables to tell you which way the hypothesis went. One of the things that's happening today is that we try to go further, like rather than just going out in the field and trying to test things, well, in a field, in a lab, in a flume, we're often now very interested in having a mechanistic predictive model. The value of that is that we can then take the model and change the conditions of the system in a model and see what happens. As long as we're staying within the same laws of physics that govern that model and govern the real world, then we can do that. So it's very important now that as part of our experimental methods that we try to construct mechanistic predictive models. Many of them exist off the shelf. And so then we can use those to test systems uh, and, and see how that's all working. So that can be done both in the real, in the field, or lab, or it can also be done within a modeling framework. So this brings us to the modern era of what I call near census river science. This is somewhat similar to uh, another term that you hear a lot now, which is called riverscapes. The main difference between riverscapes and near census is that riverscapes allows that um, we don't necessarily have to have high quality data, that the total quantity of vast amount of data across a riverscape 
is good enough to get us to the central tendency of that system. And this has generally, you know, uh, been talked about throughout, you know, economics and other fields. Like you could take a lot of people making weak predictions will yield a more likely outcome of success for the prediction than taking like five experts and asking them to predict an outcome. That's the riverscape approach. Near Census also seeks to have comprehensive data across the riverscape, but it refuses to accept low quality data. That is that we're not gonna sacrifice that quantity. So we wanna have comprehensive analysis, no more sampling. Um, ultimately, you know, if you're even with remote sensing, it is still a sampling in a sense because you have a resolution of what the data is that's being collected from the sensor. But it's not the same as the 20th century statistical sampling design. We want an approach that's spatially explicit, so not just, again, not just a statistical sample, assuming data is independent and identically distributed. Instead, we have to assume that there's tremendous amounts of autocorrelation in the data. We also want to be mindful of the processes that are occur in the landscape. And here's the linchpin right now. In my opinion, we're at a point where what we really want to have is meter scale data. If we could have meter scale data across the landscape for all of our variables, that's going to get us really far. Now, obviously a variable like grain size distribution is not going to work at a meter scale. However, we already know from all kinds of meter scale data, you can successfully infer substrate patterns from machine learning and other analysis tools. And I certainly accept that, you know, as we move forward, say 15 years from now, 30 years from now, 60 years from now, we'll go way down these scales. But ultimately, that'll just become a scaling problem. And for most of our analyses for rivers, we'll be coming back to a meter scale. To some extent, we can non-dimensionalize this. So if you have something that's, you know, 500 meter wide river, we may not need meter scale there. On the other hand, if you have a two meter wide river, then you might need smaller than one meter scale. So we have to be sort of mindful of that. But in general, something about a meter scale across the landscape, if we had that for all kinds of data, there's a lot we could do. And these kinds of meter scale data sets, as well as models, are emerging so quickly now. I mean, when I started my career in 1998, this was like, very, very difficult to achieve. Today, we've got all kinds of data. The top is a piece of a, a topographic map of the Lower Yuba River where I do a lot of work. And the bottom is a two-dimensional hydrodynamic model showing velocities for the same spot. You know, red is high velocity, blue is, is low velocity. When you look at these topographic maps, like in the upper, you just marvel at the beauty and the, com well, I hate to say, now I'm about to use the word complexity, so darn on me, but you know, just, just um, the detail of what is in there. For a lot of places, when, if I were to, someone would ask me, hey, hey Greg, go throw a cross section here, go find a pool and give me a pool and a riffle cross section. I look at this and I'm like, you know, why would I ever do that? what even makes a pool or riffle cross-section anymore? I, I reject the whole notion of that anymore. Now we have to rethink the totality of what's going on in far more complex terms. And um, you, know, you can see from the bottom, bottom uh, hydrological, or hyd sorry, hydraulic model that um, there's a tremendous amount of flow complexity on the landscape. And, and this, of course, isn't even a fully accurate model. We can do lots of things today. We can extract landforms that are spatially explicit. So pools no longer have to be across a whole cross section or riffles. Like why is this, why would you have a riffle cross section? A riffle might be, you know, you, you might have a uh, slack water uh, on the bank and then transitioning a uh, riffle transition, riffle, shoot, you know, I mean, you, you get a, uh, uh, an array of things. And, and it's not just riffle, pool, riffle, pool but there is um, a whole palette of different kinds of landforms that will vary from setting to setting. But today, the technology exists and it's improving better and better with new journal articles that are coming out that we can um, automatically extract these landforms um, with m far, far less subjectivity than the field methods were ever um, close to doing. Another thing we can do is we can um, use maps from topographic change detection and analysis to then interpret those with also with automated decision trees to produce geomorphic process maps. 
And here's uh, a section, the, sa the same part, I believe it's the same place as from, from here. Yep, same spot. And you know, we have a menu here of 19 different geomorphic processes that could be at work. And you can see the complex pattern of processes. So one cross-section tends to have many processes at play. These processes are all flow dependent, so at any one location, different processes can be at work at different flows. It just, it just raises the awareness of variability that's there. Not random variability, but organized variability. We can also do things very accurately now, like mapping habitat presence, absence, or quality. And here's uh, something that I've used many times in many presentations. It shows a, a microhabitat prediction with a 2D hydrodynamic model and habitat suitability curves for depth and velocity and substrate. And this area in blue is the area predicted to be the highest quality habitat. And then the area in white and red is the lowest quality habitat. So when you make a prediction, you're not trying to just have only predict areas of high quality, you must predict, predict substantial areas of non-habitat as well. And then the black dots show the locations where in this case, the goal was like, a, it was adult Chinook salmon spawning um, for, for California. And so each black dot is a red that was created by an adult salmon spawner. And you can see that predominantly they're in the blue area. This is just, again, just illustrating the power of near census mapping, modeling, and prediction. So for a long time in my career, I was doing a lot of this kind of spatially explicit work. And the number one question that especially more senior colleagues would ask me is, hey, Greg, can't you simplify this? Like, why do we have to run models? It takes, it takes too much effort. Today, we don't care anymore about that effort. Effort has gotten quite trivial. We can make models you know, within a few hours. I mean, it, it's, it's not a big deal. However, as we get more and more engage in modeling, we're going to run into the same problem that exists in atmospheric science and ocean science, where the complexity of your models leads you to the inability to interpret the results. You know, when the models get as complicated as nature, <coughs> we can't really understand them anymore. So we always need to have approaches to simplify um, the data and results that we have to match theories and ideas that we have. And in, this is really where we're getting closer to geomorphic covariance structure theory now, because it's all about sub-reach scale vari variability. For example, here is a map where I've just showed some wetted area um, boundaries for different discharges. And you can see that at any one cross-section, you know, there's a big difference in what the cross-sectional area is. It's not all just increasing the same along the river. So we have to figure out what constitutes subreach scale variability, how do we delineate and analyze it, and then how does this variability in topography relate to fluvial processes?